Hi everyone, welcome back to the Murder Tapes podcast, season 3, episode 8. Wilson and I went to, you guessed it, Alamo Draft House over the weekend and saw Trap. It was so good, the main actor played a serial killer so well, and the FBI tricks were very realistic, so you should definitely watch it if you haven't already. Also, we moved this coming Monday, and I am so excited to be able to up the quality on the podcast. I really appreciate you all and truly hope that you learned some new things from these episodes. Aside from that, I hope you guys had a great weekend, and today we're going to be talking about the Stephen Francis Supel case, also known as the Iowa City Supel murders. Stephen Francis Supel was born on August 13, 1965, to William and Patricia Tierney Supel. He graduated from Regina High School and went on to earn a degree from the University of Northern Iowa. The Supel name holds significant recognition in Iowa City. William F. Supel, father of Stephen, is a partner at the Mearden Supel and Downer Law Firm in the city. His brother, William J. Supel, is also an attorney at the same firm. Additionally, their relative, Bud Supel, owns Supel's Flowers and is a dedicated supporter of the University of Iowa. Quote, Whenever you hear the Supel name, you just know it's good people, said Johnson County Supervisor Terrence Newsel. His wife, 42-year-old Cheryl Kesterson, was born February 21, 1966, in Sioux City, the daughter of Jack and Gisela Frey Kesterson. She graduated from Iowa City High School and the University of Iowa with a master's degree in education. She was a teacher in the Iowa City School District from 1989 to 2001 at Mann, Penn, and Wickham Elementaries. When Steve and Cheryl wed on June 13, 1990, they dreamed of building a large family in alignment with their beliefs. They welcomed four children into their lives through adoption from South Korea. The couple's first son, Ethan, arrived at the Omaha airport cradled by a nanny, and it brought tears to the eyes of every person present in the arrivals area, as her mom recounted to approximately 1,000 mourners gathered at the church on Saturday morning. Ethan was born on November 2, 1997, and was a fourth grader at Longfellow Elementary. He enjoyed playing the cello, golfing, and had a passion for soccer. Seth was born on July 1, 1999, and was a second grader at Longfellow. He played the violin, raised rabbits, and had a fondness for gardening. Myra, a kindergartner at Longfellow, was just one day shy of her sixth birthday when her life was tragically cut short. The youngest of the family, Eleanor, was three years old and born on October 31, 2004. She loved dressing up and showed incredible resilience in overcoming kidney issues. Their family friend, Becky Forstner, noted that Cheryl taught third and fourth grade prior to taking time off to raise her children. Despite her departure from teaching, she has remained engaged with both the school district and the community. Documentation reveals that the Supels have made contributions to the school district's foundation participated in its run for the school's fundraiser, donated to Iowa City Hospice, and supported various other charitable organizations. In early February, Cheryl commenced her role as the Education and Training Coordinator at Four Seas Child Care Resource and Referral in Iowa City, as confirmed by Executive Director Susan Gray. Quote, She is a very caring and compassionate individual deeply invested in our mission of supporting and nurturing families in Johnson County. Stephen was a former executive at Hills Bank and Trust Company based in Iowa City, Iowa, facing serious legal troubles following charges of stealing $559,000 from the bank over several years. He also had $32,673 in unpaid loans. On February 20th, 2008, he entered a plea of not guilty to charges of embezzlement and money laundering. While he pleaded not guilty, he reportedly admitted to stealing $219,000, most of which he used to buy cocaine, according to an investigator. Stephen was released on a $250,000 personal bond and his trial was scheduled for April 21st. 
The Supel family were active members of St. Mary's Catholic Church, where Stephen grew up, married, and had his children baptized. On the night of March 23rd into the early hours of March 24th, 2008, a tragic multiple murder unfolded in Iowa City, Iowa. Just the day before, the Supel family attended Easter Mass at St. Mary's Catholic Church in Iowa City. This was the same church Stephen grew up in, where him and Cheryl said their vows, and where their kids were baptized. According to family and friends, Stephen and Cheryl seemed perfectly fine and there was nothing unusual about their behavior. That same Sunday night, a family friend stopped at their home to visit Stephen. He only saw one of the children, but didn't notice anything unusual either. Authorities have gathered evidence indicating that Stephen fatally bludgeoned his wife, 42-year-old Cheryl, and their four adopted children, 10-year-old Ethan, 9-year-old Seth, 5-year-old Myra, and 3-year-old Eleanor, before taking his own life. The Iowa State Medical Examiner's Office stated there were blunt force injuries to their upper torsos and heads. Two baseball bats have been linked to their deaths. Law enforcement reports reveal that the suspect first attacked his wife Cheryl in their master bedroom, killing her before he took the children to the garage, where he attempted to asphyxiate them with carbon monoxide. When that effort failed, he resorted to using a baseball bat to kill his children. Two of the kids were found in upstairs bedrooms, one was found in a basement bedroom, and another was found in a basement toy room. Following this horrific act, he went to a nearby city park in an attempt to drown himself, but he was not able to sink himself. After that attempt also proved unsuccessful, he called 911 to request emergency assistance at his residence. The 911 call transcript goes as follows. This is 911. What's the location of your emergency? The female dispatcher said. Hello, am I talking to Iowa City? Stephen replied. The dispatcher then asked for the location again. Iowa City, Iowa, said Stephen. The dispatcher asked for the location again. Iowa City, Iowa. Then they asked for an address. 629 Barrington Road, the man said. Please go there immediately. When the dispatcher asked what was going on, the caller hung up. About six minutes after the 911 call, dispatchers received additional reports of a minivan that had crashed into a concrete pillar in the median of Interstate 80, east of town. Stephen had driven the family minivan at high speed into a concrete pillar on Interstate 80, approximately nine miles from their home. The impact resulted in severe injuries that ultimately led to his death compounded by a fire that consumed the vehicle. His remains were so badly burned that identification was only possible through dental records. One caller, sobbing, described seeing the minivan engulfed in flames after the head-on collision. Quote, Oh my God, the car's on fire. I was going to stop and help, but the car's on fire. As I mentioned earlier, court records revealed that Stephen Supel was indicted on charges of embezzling approximately $560,000 from Hills Bank and Trust in Johnson County, where he served as vice president and controller. Stephen pleaded not guilty to charges of embezzlement and money laundering in U.S. District Court and was released on a $250,000 personal bond. The government also sought the forfeiture of the stolen funds. His trial was set to begin on April 21st. Stephen had left a handwritten four-page note detailing the killings and revealing the timeline of events. This note was left in the kitchen and was written for their surviving family members. It was clearly written after he killed his family, and it includes details that match the crime scene evidence as well as the medical examiner's findings. Stephen also left several voicemail messages at Mirden, Supel, and Downer, where his father and brother worked. In these messages, he expressed remorse and despair over his legal issues and the loss of his job as vice president at Hills Bank and Trust. He apologized numerous times throughout these messages and kept saying that his family was in heaven. He also mentioned that ever since his legal problems came to light, he was having trouble dealing with it. Stephen even wrote sticky notes on library books with instructions on where to return them. Reverend Ken Kuntz, the St. Mary's pastor, would say, quote, 
I will never be able to pray the Lord's Prayer the same way again. Ken said after the burial, adding that he had never seen forgiveness in such a powerful and immediate way. It's embedded in my mind how the families have witnessed that in the face of that tragedy. In a heartfelt expression of shared sorrow, Bill and Patricia Supel, the parents of Stephen, and Jack and Gisela Kesterson, the parents of Cheryl, leaned on one another for support during the emotional 90-minute funeral service. Ken praised the parents for their decision to hold the mass for the whole family, saying, quote, Gisela, Jack, Pat, and Bill, you are a powerful testament to the meaning of forgiveness. We all need healing. We all need God. David Kesterson, Cheryl's older brother, struggled with tears as he recounted his own experience, noting that forgiving Steve was the easiest thing that he did the previous week. Quote, there is nothing we've done that God can't redeem. He expressed later reflecting sentiments he shared during the funeral. Quote, Unfortunately, Steve overlooked that lesson. Otherwise, we wouldn't be facing this tragedy. He explained that his faith, which he found 11 years ago as a member of Open Bible Church in Cedar Rapids, enabled him to forgive instantly. Quote, Forgiveness wasn't a conscious choice. It was a non-issue. When we couldn't find Steve and were uncertain of his situation, we hoped to discover him alive, not for justice's sake, but out of love. I lost not just my sister and her four beautiful children, but also my brother-in-law, who felt like a true brother. Reflecting on the profound loss, David added, Nobody won. The unfortunate thing is that the enemy won the battle. But if you read the rest of the book, you know who won the war. Tom Baldridge, one of their family friends, would say, quote, It's very difficult to believe Stephen's mind snapped. He couldn't have gotten into the thought process that would have allowed him to do this if he were rational and sane. Susan Goodner, another family friend, said, quote, I've been numb since I heard the news. Through the law, through the community service, through service to their church community, they've just been an example of how to be a good citizen. A funeral was held for all six family members at St. Mary's Catholic Church in Iowa City, and they were buried at St. Joseph's Cemetery. Family members would say that placing the mother and her children in the same eternal home with the husband and father who killed them was the ultimate act of forgiveness. Cheryl's older brother, David Kesterson, would say, quote, The thought of having them laid to rest separately was unthinkable. They were a family in life. They are a family in death. Their legacy is love. That's what they will be remembered for. We've talked about family annihilators before on this podcast and why they do what they do, but I'm going to mention it again in case you haven't listened to other episodes. The main motivations include family breakdown, concerns about appearance, financial difficulties, mental health issues, domestic violence, divorce, infidelity, custody battles, jealousy, substance abuse, and many more. Additionally, offenders' actions following the familiar side include completed or attempted suicide, denial, or evasion. In this case, financial troubles were the root. Stephen didn't think his wife Cheryl would be able to take care of herself and the kids, but that wasn't a decision for him to make. This whole case is very tragic, and I can't imagine how their family feels after learning about what Stephen did. It always terrifies me to think of fathers or mothers that can do this to their entire family without showing signs beforehand. As always, all evidence and photos will be available in the show notes as well as on our Instagram at Murder Tapes Podcast. Feel free to follow my personal as well at Annalisa. Thank you so much for listening and I hope to see you on the next one.